Hello, and thank you very much for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. Appreciate you tuning into this episode. I wanted to talk today about uh, picking up a Christmas tree. I think it's coming into that kind of season and stuff. It's kind of cool. Uh, a lot of Christmas tree farms and stuff around Oregon, you know, as uh, people kind of normally find. Uh, a lot of uh, Christmas tree stands that are run by what seem like sort of sketchy operations sometimes. But uh, they got the trees. I need the trees. That's sort of how it goes most of the time, right? If you're looking for the noble fir or the Douglas fir or whatever it is you're after, noble fir is always the top, you know. Um, but if you are, what I found and what you might know too and uh, what really takes a good bit of effort to see uh, follow through with, but uh, you can get a a permit from the Forest Service and go out to National Forest Land and cut down your own noble fir tree and set it up as your Christmas tree for the year. Pretty cool, pretty neat thing. If you're uh, able for it and up for it, it's a kind of a fun family activity, as I'd assume. Uh, and it's cool if you have the time to kind of put into it. It sort of makes it a little bit of, a, of an outdoors activity to go about and do. But uh, I was looking it up in Oregon. You have to get a permit to do such a thing first. So, um, so like uh, trees like this are, are sort of, um, I guess it's a finite resource. So there's regulations on its use and its access and I guess your access to it. So they issue these permits through the, uh, the National forest service and uh it's for uh for national forest areas you have to kind of select the forest region that you'd be cutting from and then they kind of manage this so if there's not a if the forest area that you're trying to go to doesn't have uh doesn't have that resource then you don't really get to do it there um, but over here in the cascade range uh along the west coast through oregon and then over into the coastal range of mountains there's a bunch of opportunity uh for people to pick up uh, what I think are pretty cool Christmas trees. Now, it's interesting, you know, like when you see uh, trees that have grown wild, they, they don't really grow the same as farm trees do. So the density of the branches as they, as they come up to their six, seven, or eight foot height, or I guess kind of what under 12, I think is what the permit rec it says. It's got to be a tree under 12 feet. And I don't know, like somewhere around like less than six inches around or something like that. There's probably some some more specifics of it. You'll see that when you find it. I actually found sort of contradicting information as I looked around for the, the piece. You know, there's different permits I guess you can get. I guess like, the, you know, the White House, they'll send someone over or, you know, like the state, the Capitol building had a, a noble fur cut down from Lane County two years ago or last year or something like that. But, uh, you know, it's... Uh, it's kind of interesting. They come all the way out here. They, we've got the noble firs. They're growing in the right elevation. Noble firs, I guess, grow in really high elevation areas. So you have to go up uh, pretty high on the mountain to get those uh, those more bluish colored, uh, kind of tighter bristled, um, you know, or tighter tighter needle patterned uh, trees that they have up there. But uh, but yeah, those noble firs I think are, are pretty cool. And I like their kind of the bluish tone, the bluish green tinge that they have, or kind of that ashy blue. Uh, kind of tinge that they have on the on the fir tree there is, is kind of fun, but uh, but yeah, a bunch of different fir tree uh, varieties that you can pick up up there, and the permit is really easy. I think it's five bucks. You go online, you go to Oregon.gov or whatever. You go over to the I think it's like the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and then you can go onto that site. You can look at permits. You can look at uh, Christmas trees. If you search it on Google, you'll you'll pull up the Christmas tree permit page right away. But it was five bucks for me to pick up a permit to try and cut down a Christmas tree up in the mountains. Uh, so I thought that was kind of cool. I picked up a, a spot, I think over in like the, uh, well, I guess what would it be? I think it's the Willamette National Forest as it's listed there. Yeah, Willamette National Forest area, uh, which is a really big region of area. And then as you go up higher in elevation, you're able to find some spots that have uh, different varieties of trees. Now, it's risky too, because for a lot of that stuff, you have to you have to get up in the areas where you're probably near or above the snow line as you're getting into the Christmas season stuff, unless it's a year where you haven't had a lot of um, high elevation snowfall yet, or you know, like not much rainfalls come over the valley, not much snowfalls landed up in the hills from that. Um, so it kind of depends on what time of year you get it, but uh, but if you're going to, getting into the second or so week of December, it's pretty likely that here in Oregon you're going to have hit the freeze point. You're going to have hit a couple of winter storms that have dropped uh, a good bit of snow on elevations above 3,000 feet. 
Um, so you kind of have to look at it a little bit. But if you do get out there and the road's plowed and you do get to a location where you can see those trees, it's really kind of a tricky and sort of, um, I don't know, it's kind of interesting to sort of bushwhack back in there to get to a spot where you can find a tree and then find the right kind of tree in the right kind of location with the right kind of tree populations around it so that it's okay for you to cut it. And then you can harvest that tree, yank it back to your truck, take it down, clean it up outside, and then uh, dress it up like your holiday Christmas tree inside your house. So kind of fun uh, that you can do that sort of stuff out here, and it's kind of a, a fun little alternative to the 50-plus uh, bucks you'll pay for some kind of Douglas for Noble for version uh, of a tree that you can get at one of the tree farms and stands that you get uh, down in the valley floor through the, the winter time. But sometimes you can find a cool deal, but, man, I don't know if you can beat a $5 permit to go cut out your own tree. So if you're familiar with the backwoods, you're familiar with uh, how to cut stuff down, man, it's a cool way to get out and, uh, and take care of it. I think you have to have a saw, like a hand saw, uh, you got to cut it down kind of near the base, and then you got to do a little bit of uh, rewilding to sort of make it look like that stump has sort of disappeared. Some of the other stuff around it was that I think it had to be from an area where there were a number of other seedlings of about that age grouping growing together. And I think the idea was that if there was maybe – you do find this out there too where you find like 15 or 20 or 30 of these – trees growing all kind of in a tight grove together and really it's it's too close for those trees to have their the best survival rate or the best growth opportunity that they could have so what they recommend is a sort of a thinning process so what you're supposed to do is not cut down you know if you have trees one through four you're not supposed to cut them all down in a row like that you're kind of supposed to like mix between them so you're sort of spreading it out a little bit thinning it out um, so that uh, the trees that are left there have a better opportunity to grow larger, grow bigger, get more sunlight, and have uh, have better access to the environment that they're in there. So you kind of thin them out a little bit, and then it's supposed to help the tree production uh, into the years uh, in the future. So fun and pretty cool. And uh, if I find a good spot, man, it'd be uh, it'd be great. But it's tricky when you get up there at higher ele- elevations where those uh, where those noble firs seem to hang out. Um, you got to be a little careful. It seems like a lot of those terrain areas are real mountainous, real steep, and uh, pretty tricky to get out into. If you're able to find like a nice broad and sort of open area, uh, and you're able to kind of move through there in a more simple way, like a logger would. I mean, yeah, you can get you can probably cover a lot of ground. You can probably find a lot of cool stuff out in the backwoods and stuff. But uh, but yeah, some of those areas out there they get real claustrophobic, real tight in, and uh, it's kind of hard in those in taller sort of grown forest areas uh, you really don't find a lot of brushy seedlings that are kind of dense just inches above the ground like you'd want a christmas tree you know you don't want the, the christmas tree branches starting 10 feet up in the air or whatever it is or to have gaps in between the branches of feet apart you know it's a one foot or two foot gap in between the low branch and the next mid branch up um, and that's sort of uh, naturally how a lot of those trees end up starting to grow. But if you're able to find the right types of specimens in the right age grouping, they're going to grow densely and, uh, and they're going to grow kind of similar to the way that you see uh, farmed Christmas trees. Farmed Christmas trees are pruned, however, and that kind of helps promote and direct and, and angle the, the type of growth that they have. And that's where you get that real kind of conical uh, shape to it that's really consistent as a product over over the years but if you go out and get your own wild christmas tree man it's a lot of fun and you can uh yeah you can have something that's really quite a bit different than what you'd have uh, from a store a lot larger too man if you got a vaulted ceiling no better value than heading out to the forest to get your own i think uh i think you have a limit of 12 feet i've seen 15 feet as a listing on other permit sites too and then in addition to that i think there's special permits uh, where as instead of just kind of the wide open broad Christmas tree permit for any given Christmas tree, you know, for the kind of like your household one, I think you can get a special permit where you can go for like a 25 foot tree. Um, that takes a lot of effort, a lot of utility to try and get that tree out of the woods and then into your house. So I think that's kind of why it's a, a limited option in some ways, but, uh, but yeah, you can get stuff that's, uh, awfully tall. I mean, yeah, like, uh, 14 feet, I think is, that's you, you know, like two, two stories is 20 feet, right? So. I don't know. I don't know how vaulted your ceilings are, but uh, but yeah, I'd be up to the top. So it's kind of cool that uh, that yeah, you can go out to the woods. You can find those pieces if you uh, identify it correctly. Uh, you can harvest it out, carry it back to your house, and set it up. I think it's pretty fun. So uh, I might be looking into that this year. I definitely got a permit. 
it's pretty fun to to grab a permit. I got a permit last year, and it's really fun to go out looking for a tree and stuff. And, uh, that's kind of the the fun part of the holidays and stuff here. So something that's coming up pretty soon, but c- kind of continuing with some of the stuff that I've been talking about the last couple episodes, talking about uh, some everyday carry camping stuff that uh, an outdoorsy stuff that I have around with me. I was, I was going to talk a bit about flashlights too. I've uh, been trying to pick up some uh, some kind of outdoor flashlights that I can have around with me. How did the headlight? How I have a headlamp. I have a black diamond headlamp. I like that headlamp. It works pretty well for me. It's a pretty uh, rugged, kind of outdoorsy, sort of REI ready tool. Works pretty well. I think it's around like 190 lumens or so for the spotlight piece. And then there's sort of a a not as bright kind of wide angle LED light on there too. Also has the switch over to the red LED. A lot of that stuff is nice. Works pretty well. Hasn't really failed me yet. Runs on three AAA batteries. I think it's a pretty cool piece. I think it's been fine. Um, I've been also kind of looking around at other flashlight units and other kind of outdoors um, sort of uh, work and utility flashlights that I can get a hold of. Um, for the longest time, as I was a, a kid, I was really into the mag light systems, you know, like the, the kind of like the cop lights that you'd have. It runs on the D cell uh, size batteries. And I had like the, the two cell flashlight. That was a good one to kind of put. And uh, they have like a truck holster, these little uh, pins that you could put down, kind of drill them straight down to the bed of your truck by your uh, your left hand driver's side as you kind of drop down to the floor there before you get out your driver's side door. And you could kind of pop in a two cell mag light there as your truck light. And I always thought that was pretty cool. And uh, <laughs> but I'd have the I have the mag lights and stuff around a long time. Uh, I think they're, they have, that's what you know they have like the five cell mag light. They have a four cell, a three cell. They have the two double A mag lights. They have you know them all across the, the lineup and stuff. Had those for years. Those ended up kind of failing on me after a while. I know they're really not supposed to, but I think like the back end sort of rusted up, and then I had some trouble with corrosion with the batteries that were in there, and I wasn't able to break it open with the the PB blaster penetrating fluid that I was hoping to use on it. Anyway, that's all to say that uh, mag light has been. Put aside, I think, for a couple of years. I've been using other stuff. LED is the way to go. Maglite hasn't really updated the technology so that you're still using kind of a real lame, like 50 or 80 lumen um, incandescent bulb that they just pop in there, uh, which I think is really inferior, especially at this point. And their LED conversion options that they make, I think, are really limited and aren't really anywhere near the type of LED. Uh, it's, you know, it's just, it's, it's like a reproduction of the same incandescent bulb, but as like an LED. It has a real kind of harsh, I thought, blue light to it. And it doesn't really have that kind of uh, bright and crisp sort of layout uh, and focusing beam system that you get even with really cheaply made Chinese LED lights now. So I was trying to find um, something that kind of brought in some of the cool sort of outdoorsy or utility stuff, toughness that the mag light had with its branding or, you know, kind of with its flashlight engineering. Uh, and then something that kind of brought in some of the cool LED focusing beam light technology stuff that we have with the more modern flashlight set that we've had over the last uh, 10 years or so, right? Like blue LEDs came out in 2008, something like that. So that's the first time that we had red, green, and blue LEDs, which allowed us to make white LEDs. And that allowed us to make, you know, all these cool color changing uh, light emitting diode patterns that we have now. And that's where we can get these diodes that are real bright and just kick out a ton of light versus their power output. So we can run these incredibly bright thousand lumen flashlights out of just like a handheld couple battery, you know, like, I don't know, a few, what, a four D cell battery or an eight double A cell battery. You can load up these flashlights or you can load them up with your own rechargeable batteries, which is a really cool new feature. You, know, you kind of juice them up with USB like your iPhone. And then punch that light on. You can run a sustained uh, like 1,000 lumen torch for hours off of that. It's really cool how you have those kind of options now. So that's the sort of stuff that I was looking into. I was looking into a couple different brands of sort of um, durable, reliable, and uh, useful sort of outdoor utility flashlights. Um, I think that the Marines or Special Forces use one specific light that's like $1,000. It's insanely priced. Then... I was finding this other one, Streamlight. I don't know, have you heard of these flashlights? I've heard of them a bit before. I've seen them in uh, some other stuff, and it seems like they're kind of uh, 
I don't know, sort of like an industry standard. So I think if you're doing a lot of like first responder work or like you work with an, you work in an ambulance, I think you have a, like Streamlight has a contract with a lot of emergency response people. And so they have like these Streamlight flashlights, some really cool stuff. It seems like nicely made um, utilities, a lot of metal flashlights, a lot of polycarbonate flashlights, a lot of safety flashlights, a lot of, uh, uh, what are they? not lanterns? I don't know, like these big, you know, kind of like big, carry lights that have like three sort of like uh three led diodes laid out in this triangle shape on the front and then a red flash on the side man it's just big old honking lights but they're expensive man if you get if you get uh i think like their top uh, whatever their their 20 it's like it's like iphones or something but man they're serious about it their 2020 model flashlight is like 170 dollars you get like a thousand lumen handheld flashlight it's rechargeable. It's got a bunch of buttons on it. It's supposed to be drop proof, shatter proof, tactical proof, or you know, all sorts of stuff that they're kind of making claims on um, on its usefulness and, and its reliability. And it's pretty cool, man. These lights are just incredible on like some of the stuff that they can do. It seems, you know, I mean, uh, or at least like to, to whatever degree they're trusted in uh, emergency response or police use. I think like the police use these stream lights. Uh, lights a lot. A lot of people in uh, kind of professional settings seem to to use them a lot. So I was looking around at them. Minimum, even just for pen lights, those are starting at like thirty bucks. It seems like. And then as you're getting into like some of their nicer mid range stuff, you're talking about fifty bucks a light, or you're talking up from there into something even uh, even higher into like the hundred dollar, like averaging eighty dollars to a hundred dollars to two hundred dollars or two hundred and fifty dollars for some of these uh these lantern lights that they have listed out there so cool cool lights cool flashlights man if i was going to get a premium flashlight <laughs> i'd probably get one of these seems like they're going to last a long time um, seems like they have good warranties with them and they've got like a bunch of a bunch of different stuff around it that uh that seems like man what a cool light or you know like that's going to be a really reliable constructed piece that you can carry around with you but at that price point i just can't really see that it matches what i need and where i need to go very well i can't really spend 75 dollars on a flashlight it just sort of doesn't really quite fit with what i'm trying to be up to right now and for the way that i've kind of been talking you know it's like flashlights sort of go bad you know use them for a while but you don't use them all the time uh or at least like in my circumstance like you know it's like uh, i use it i like to use it i need to have a flashlight i got them i got them around where i need them but uh, i need it to be good but i also need it to fit a certain price point um where you kind of get the the best uh sort of trade-off between these two different things and i think you can make a quality flashlight for less than a hundred dollars right so i was looking around i found this other brand out of portland um called coast and you see them they're distributed everywhere you can find them in a lot of places you can i think you can find them at walmart uh you can find them on amazon they're all over on amazon in stock uh, you can find them on their site you can find them what was i going to say at home depot they've got a big selection uh, just laid out at Home Depot there. You can get a bunch of different pieces, lanterns, uh, magnetic work lights, uh, like utility lights, and then a bunch of ranges of flashlights. And they have a steel, or like, how do I say, like a, a mag light style series that's sort of a steel metal casing. And then they also have this other one that's a polycarbonate casing that's uh, sort of like, um, I don't know, it would almost look like plastic, but it's like a, a steel case with a polycarbonate coating that's supposed to be good for some outdoor or, you know, some kind of, um, well, I guess, uh, higher work stress threshold uh, flashlights. So I think um, that's kind of what I went. I went with Coast, uh, and I thought it was kind of cool that they were a Portland company. They've got a whole LED line. They've got like a line of knives too that are inexpensive and kind of cool to get a hold of. And if you can find them, I'd throw one of those in the toolbox. It seems kind of fun. Um, but uh, these lives, these uh, these lights, these flashlights, is pretty easy to get a hold of. I, I picked up um, a Poly Steel 400. I think that's a 400 lumen uh, handheld Poly Steel light. It takes four double A's, and that's got like a real solid beam on it. And the Poly Steel is cool. It's that polycarbonate case, so it's kind of like it's kind of like uh, plastic, but it's like uh, it's like that. It's a polycarbonate, so it's like the plastic, or you know, it's like that kind of uh, the plastic that's on a Glock handle, or it's on uh, you know like a knife handle or something like that. But real sturdy. You can kind of slam that thing onto the ground, and it seems like it. 
uh, it still stays intact, still uh, still works. And I think that's uh, sort of one of the things that this this model prides itself. You can go online to uh, coastportland.com, their website, and you can watch these tests, these uh, stress tests of their flashlights where for, for whatever use this is, I don't know if, if you're, if you're going to do this a bunch, I guess get this flashlight. But they, they have a guy up on like a 10-story building and he chucks this lit flashlight off the building down into an empty parking lot below. You watch the flashlight fall to the ground, drop, boom, bounce, kick over, slide off, and uh, the light stays on. <laughs> wow, what a miracle. It still works. Uh, so I guess the, I guess it's tough is what they're telling me, uh, which is really actually pretty wild. If you try and do that with a lot of other LED flashlights, you, you're really going to have that LED. Um, you're going to have the power to the LED interrupted from the battery source. That's going to get knocked out and probably cracked or messed up. Uh, and the LED circuitry itself is going to crack and shatter. And you're not going to be able to use that chip anymore to emit light in the same way that you had been before. So that's what's really cool about these is that they can take what seems like, uh, you know, like, what are you doing this for kind of a thing. But they're crush proof. I think they're waterproof IPX8 rated flashlights. Uh, they've got the uh, the COB, the chip on board uh, light panel, LED light panel kind of on the side of one of the flashlights that I picked up. Uh, you know, it's got the straight beam ahead. And then it's got that kind of newer LED lantern effect that uh, some of these flashlights have now where it's got instead of just like a single spotlight LED lens through the front of the light, they've got this like strip of LEDs. Now on the side of it, you kick, a, kick another switch, that turns on, and it's sort of more of a, a broad and open lantern light that you'd have. Or if you're walking a dog or something like that, or you want to kind of fill ambiently the light in a room when, with a flashlight, you can kick that light on. And sort of a softer illumination across across the ground without any uh, kind of spotlight. And it's sort of a warmer white color, too. You also click that button one more time, boom, it turns into red. So you got a safety light. You click it one more time, and you've got flashing reds, which is uh, pretty cool that you have uh, a few of those different options. But, uh, but yeah, I got um, I got that one. That's, a, I think, a, almost a 1,000. What is it? I should get that right. I think it's... I think it's 800 lumens out the front spotlight and then another 500 lumen light out the side chip on board um, COB or whatever it is, but uh, that, that side light. So, uh, yeah, really bright lights. I got that 400 lumen spotlight. There's also, um, like I was talking about headlamps earlier, I had that black diamond one. I think that was like a, maybe like 150 lumens. It sort of averaged out to be there for the spotlight and the wide the wide light that I had there for for this coast stuff, they have a they have a headlamp. It looks more like a miner's headlamp, you know. Like the cool thing about the LED stuff, the the backpacker stuff, um, that's all kind of sleek in design. It's small. It's kind of a compact methodology that they're laying it out in. But if you look back in time and you look at um, like the miners' lights, they had these miner headlamps. It was oh man, how silly would that have been? But I think it was just kind of a shiny piece of metal that kind of cupped around a pretty regular incandescent bulb, and that was supposed to sort of lens forward your light for you so you could kind of grab it and focus it all toward the toward the front of you. And uh, that was a pretty inferior way of doing it at the time, but that was how they produced their headlamp spotlights at the time. They've kind of improved that technology over the last 100 years, of course. And uh, even during the, the you know, the battery-operated days, you would have like a, a big miner's light. Like the high-end headlamps are like just these big old beastly lights, and then it runs a wire down to your hip where on your belt you have a battery pack hooked up, and then you kind of switch it on from there. It juices up your light up your back on a, on a cable, and then boom, out the front of the light comes, I don't know, 500 lumens or 400 lumens or whatever it is. You get, you get your real sustained light there. Um, now with some of the advancements of the LED stuff, you still have those lights and those are really high end and really cool technical lights. But even just looking at, uh, some of these, uh, kind of more simple, uh, headlamps from coast that they had, they had, you know, kind of the big kind of miners headlamp style spotlight section thing there. And that put out 400 lumens of light, which was, uh, you know, maybe I don't know, double at least what my little headlamp was doing. Um, so it's kind of cool that you can just kind of pop in pick up some of these other tools and stuff and, uh, and they're waterproof, crush proof, um, IPX eight rated kind of outdoor, uh, utility tools. And so it's cool that you can get a hold of those things. And it's nice that they're as inexpensive as they are. They're really a lot less than those stream light lights. Um, but man, I really like those stream lights also. So 
I'm going to try and keep an eye on them. And if it seems like it uh, comes up with a, a good deal or a good value on trying to pick up one of those, um, those kind of stream light, higher end lights, I might go for it too. But really for the value for money and the utility that it provides, it seems like these coast lights are a real score. The last one I picked up was a pen light. So this is sort of the everyday carry light that I've got with me in my bag or actually in the ammo can. Um, I put that, uh, that kind of, that smaller polysteel 400 coast light that's in the, in the ammo can box, but in the pocket every day, I've got this, uh, this little pocket pen light, still kind of the same thing. I think it's a, a 110 lumen light. It's got two AAA batteries in it. And uh, it's about the size of a pen, just a little bigger, or kind of a, like a bit of a like a like a thick sharpie. It's sort of about as big as it is. But that slides into the pocket. It's got the same uh, waterproof rating, crush proof rating as uh, as the other pieces that I had talked about. But yeah, it's just a, a smaller uh, handheld pen light that I like uh, really quite a bit. I think it's pretty cool to to have uh, to have like a more full size light. I know my I know my phone has its LED on it. That's really nowhere near as bright. Is what I'm able to get out of this uh, out of this pen light. So it's kind of cool having that uh, piece around me. And even even already in the last couple of days, I've noticed I pulled this thing out a lot more than I thought I would to try and uh, try and use it as a utility, especially in spots where the uh, the phone light would come in as no good. So kind of fun stuff going around, working the uh, flashlights, trying to check out some different brands and stuff. Maybe I'll still try out a mag light in the future. Those are kind of fun for uh, nostalgia's sake, but. I think some of these coast lights might be the uh, the direction I go in. It's kind of fun. What was the other thing I was talking about? Probably all that I really need to talk about. The only other thing I've been up to, and this is probably really exciting for you guys. <laughs> this is the Easter egg. Is um, I have rewaterproofed my Gore-Tex shell. So I've got uh, I've got a I've got a Gore-Tex shell. It's worked great. Probably one of my best pieces of gear. Uh, this one was made by Marmot. It's a it's a Marmot orange pack light Gore-Tex shell. Really like this one. It's uh, been with me for like five years now, probably. Before that, I had another Gore-Tex shell that I got in blue. I picked it up from Goodwill. Man, what an amazing find. That's probably like one of the best uh, Goodwill pickups I've, I've picked, I've found before. Marina found it for me. It was fantastic. Really happy that I got that one. I used that one for years. It was too small for me though. It wasn't really quite, quite the right size. So, uh, so yeah, I swapped that up with a new one that I got, um, and I've been using that for years. The, the waterproofing, the hydrophobic uh, waterproofing uh, material that was on the coating of the jacket has kind of worn off now. So when I was out in the rain a couple weeks ago, I was noticing uh, that it was really penetrating, not through the Gore-Tex, uh, like through the shell to my skin, but it was penetrating the top nylon layer that was there. So the nylon layer was getting really wet. And then the, I think the use or the breathability of the Gore-Tex is kind of impeded by that. You stay dry and uh, I was fine in that way, but it, it kind of adds a lot of weight to the jacket and it, and it, it isn't really operating at, uh, at its full performance, I guess, in that way. So I was looking online, I was trying to find out what Marmot recommends for, um, for care of your garments and stuff. And so it, it provides like a bunch of different information there about how to deal with your down. Like, do you need to waterproof your down or do you need to wash your down jacket, you, you know, your insulated puffy jacket? Um, do you need to just wash out your puffy jacket or um, or like synthetic fleece jacket or whatever it might be? Or in this case, like a, a nylon jacket, like a soft shell or a Gore-Tex shell, like what I'm working with. So there's like different types, types of detergent that they kind of offer to deal with that. I don't really get into much of that stuff. I know there's a lot of products out there that do plenty of things. Um, there, I don't really think these kind of high-end um, materials are as delicate as they say. Down, I kind of put in a different category. Wool, I put in a different category. Um, but these sort of synthetic soft shell materials or, or nylon shell materials, they're, they're pretty durable in a lot of ways. So, uh, so with a lot of time, uh, like what I did with the shell this last time is I took, uh, took the shell, I put it in a five gallon bucket, filled it with water, like hot water. And then, um, I put just a little bit of like, just like a bead of Dawn soap in there and diluted that in the water. And what I was trying to do was, uh, was kind of soak that, that pack light jacket or that Gore-Tex marmot jacket 
for 24 hours is what I was going for. And then I'd kind of give it a good shake every once in a while and sort of uh, see like how soaked I could get that, how penetrated I could get that. And if, uh, if I could really get that uh, detergent or, you know, get the soap in there with the water and, and the heat of it enough to kind of break up uh, some of those dark sort of sooty materials that have kind of landed into the sleeves and landed onto the hem of the jacket there. So it's just gotten dirty through use of me kind of rubbing up on stuff with my stomach. Uh, or like up by my hips where my belt is, and then uh, and then up down by my sleeves, like where I put my my arms down on a table, or where I'd be like working on tools or working with something out in the dirt or in the woods or whatever it is. So those little bits, I'm trying to kind of wash up out of it. So I soaked that jacket for like 24 hours and a little bit of soap. I started with hot water, of course, like cooled off after that. But uh, but then I, I yanked that jacket up out of there, kind of wrung it out a little bit, rinsed it off. Uh, pretty thoroughly, and then I did sort of a ring out. I just kind of like squished out whatever water I could. Remember, it's a Gore-Tex jacket, so water's going to get trapped in there. If you had your zippers open and you had pockets, those pockets are going to fill with water, and then it's not really going to soak through it, you know, the way you'd think it would or something. So don't crush it out of there in the same way. I definitely noticed this with my puffy jacket. If you got one of those, this you know, little puffy nano puff pocket cells you know the little boxes of cells and inside that is down or puff balls if you get that wet and then you kind of wring that out it's going to put pressure on those cells and then sometimes pop burst that cell and then whatever kind of puffy material is going to it's going to go out whatever weekend there is there especially if like me you put years of wear onto your jacket and some of those parts are getting thinner and thinner over time so as i tried to do sort of a delicate soak of it that worked really well then I gave too much of a crush on it to try and squeeze and wring out that water, like as if I were working with some other kind of fabric that I was more accustomed to. I squeezed, put pressure on that cell, and popped it like, uh, well, like, a, uh, like a piece of bubble wrap, that sort of a thing. Um, so that was really frustrating. And then you got to kind of like restitch that together, put the foam back in there, put the down back in there, whatever it is, and then uh, seal it back up again so that it doesn't rupture again. And then once it's ruptured, the stitching around it, you put like the little... It's sort of this, the, the nylon, it, the way that the, the fabric is laced up, it sort of, it sort of rips out into like a little uh, square or like tag shape. You, know, you get a right angle on that tear as it's sort of ripping up the X and Y axis of that threading. And uh, if it runs, then it'll run all the way up and you'll get like kind of a big tag out of it. But if you kind of stitch that L shape back together, it's good and that's great. But the weak part is just on the inside of that stitched L. So you, wherever your stitching is, then it rips away right behind that stitching. And then you stitch that, and then it rips away right behind that stitching. So it's kind of tricky to get, uh, to get the, the strength of material to, to kind of stay there again once it's, uh, once it's kind of gone. But you can do patches. You can do a little nylon patch or uh, little fabric patches and stuff. And I think most of the companies that make these, uh, these outdoor jackets and stuff sell little patch kits to, to kind of add in so you can keep your jacket going after you've, uh, you've torn it up a bit on the outside. Or you can like restuff it. Uh, Patagonia has a bunch of services. North Face has a bunch of services to renew your jacket and keep it in use, keep it on, uh, keep its life kind of continued, or, or uh, use it to pass down or something like that. I don't know. They got a, a big thing about it. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> but um, for this, trying to waterproof that Gore-Tex jacket. If there's water in the pockets. Uh, and they're open. I, I try to drain those out. They were like holding like two or three cups of water inside. So I, I dumped all those out. I hung up the jacket. Then I set it up outside on a hanger, had it air dry for a while. Cold day, man. The breeze helped a little bit, but it's really cool that Gore-Tex is what it is because it really does dry out quickly, even in the cold. Uh, you know, even like it was, it was as out in a little bit of a breeze and it was able to dry out the nylon, dry out the Gore-Tex. And then a couple hours later, I went over with this, uh, this Nick wash is what it was called. Uh, uh, kind of like a, a tech wash sort of solution. But, uh, but this one was kind of specific for Gore-Tex uh, shells. And so what you do is after, I think it dried out, or even if it doesn't dry out, what you're supposed to do is uh, put a spray on the outside of this jacket all the way around. And so you kind of get it so that it, it sort of uh, soaks up all over. And it's an interesting material. It's not water, whatever chemical. I mean, of course, it's like a hydrophobic material that's sort of waterproofing your jacket. Um, but as you spray it onto it, it sort of looks like it's getting your jacket really wet. You know, it almost looks like oil or, you know, like if you were kind of like spraying some vegetable oil on your jacket, but just kind of the way it kind of dampens it and sort of makes it look greasy almost at first. Then, because it's a, a, high, a hydrophobic chemical, it's trying to like push water away. 
it does this kind of weird thing where you spray it on and then it sort of starts to absorb it into the jacket, but then it sort of pushes it back. It's hydrophobic. It sort of beads up the water on the outside of the jacket all of a sudden as it works. You know, you see it working. It starts to beat up the, the fluid that you just sprayed onto it kind of on the outside of the jacket. And then it starts to run off the area that it's now treated and hydrophobic from. So I think you're supposed to grab that with a washcloth and kind of rub that down the rest of it. But as you kind of spray, 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 a little spritz across the jacket, front and back, over the hood, and uh, up and down the, the seams of the zippers and stuff, around the hem, around the sleeves and stuff. Try and hit those as best you can. You really notice how well it's soaked over. And then once it's soaked, you kind of wipe it down with a cloth to get rid of any of the excess uh, fluid on the outside and then let that air dry again. And that's supposed to kind of cure up to be a new hydrophobic shell that you have on the exterior of your Gore-Tex jacket. So now, and I tied it out a couple of times, but now like uh, I took like a, like a little handful, of, I had a cup of water, I took a, a little handful of it and then I kind of tossed it over like a foot at the jacket after it had cured. And that was so that the, the water would kind of come out the hand, it would beat up as a spray and then hit the jacket, sort of similar to rainfall was the hope. And it really did a great job. The jacket, uh, the water hit the jacket, beat it up outside of it instantly. It didn't look like it penetrated the nylon at all. And then with just kind of a, a quick uh, flick, it sort of all shook off like, uh, like a fresh waterproof piece of material. So kind of, uh, kind of cool. And it's nice to sort of care for, uh, care for some of those outdoor uh, layers and stuff. Really like this marmot piece. Probably uh, one of the best pieces of gear I've had in a long time. And then, yeah, caring for it a little bit is going to keep it, keep it on me and keep it with me for a long time. It's pretty fun. So thanks a lot for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. Thanks for listening to me talk about expensive flashlights and Gore-Tex waterproof hydrophobic material. What is it? Hydrophobic solutions? <laughs> I don't know what it is, but... It's uh yeah it's been cool it's been cool kind of taking care of a couple of these projects and stuff and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed listening to this episode of the podcast so if you want to check out more information about me or some of the stuff that I'm up to you can go to billynewmanphoto.com if you'd like to support the work that I'm up to you can go to billynewmanphoto.com forward slash support you can also find links to my Patreon account from there as well and. Yeah, if you're interested, go to the Amazon page. Check out some of the books that I'm trying to put together for uh, some photographs and probably all the information's up and around the website too. So check that out anytime you want. BillyNewmanPhoto.com. Thanks a lot for listening to this episode of the Billy Newman Photo Podcast. I will talk to you again next time. <laughs>